but for now it's Oceania. But you, you didn't Asia. do this based on like where there are existing female communities of entrepreneurs? No, I based no. it on... So there wasn't, any, there wasn't any research before that said, right, there, I need to go to Seoul because I know it's a very active space. No, it was more of a, I want there to be representation. Oh, I see. So you're seeding it. You're seeding it to have representation. Global representation. So, so we are doing Oceania, Asia, Middle East, and Africa for now. That's quite unusual from somebody who comes from America. Because when I work with Americans, it's like international. Is everything outside America, right? or North America, or USA, whatever you want to call it? So I think this is great. You're doing this. So, so tell us. You've interviewed 20 people, right? I want to know: Is there a difference culturally? And these female entrepreneurs you've met, do you see a difference? Like the, the, the thing that sparks them to do what they do, or the thing that drives them, or the barriers they encounter, are there any differences? Of course there are differences. We're, share all some. Share some. <laughs> we're all individuals. So what's so amazing about the millennial generation is that everyone is so different, but also similar in a couple of ways. And of course, I would be generalizing if I said all, but from my research, from all the interviews I've conducted and the people that I continue to meet, uh, the similarities are three. Um, they're, they want to, these women want to create value. They want to share their gift. And they want to do it via a business. And so that's number one. Number two is they want Sorry, to... Sorry, when you say create value, you mean like not just financial, you mean value... Is it value in terms, for a society or value, what do you mean by value? In terms of, they want to create solutions or okay. paths to achieve a goal. Okay. Whatever it is. So it's not just financial value. So we're getting to number two, which okay. is financial. So. Um, so value in terms of you have a way to help the world solve a problem, right? Yeah. Or achieve a goal. Um, but create a business. They want to own something. They want to have it be their own and be the way they want to do it, and how they see it, how they envision it. Second thing is, they do want to make money. These women are coming out of the wood shop saying, you know what, I do want to make money. I also want to feel fulfilled. I want to do something that makes me feel good about myself, and that also makes my wallet feel good, my purse feel good. So, so, this is, so that's observation number two. Number three is, these women want to change the world. I love, love this about female millennial entrepreneurs that I have met and and, and, and continue to meet, is that, in, and, and I'm really comparing it to my corporate experience, right, and from sales. There's this ever such focus on making money. Making money is number one, number two, number three, focus. For women, from, from my experience, my conversations, this is overwhelm of wanting to change the world, have a positive impact, and also make money. And if it was Not agrees with you heavily. <laughs> Brilliant. So wait, so can I just rewind? You're saying that in the corporate world, which is dominated by men, the the drive is let's just get more cash. I'm, I'm simplifying because I'm a man, I'm allowed to. <laughs> I, I don't know, that's what men do. Um, I got processes. And then you're saying that these women entrepreneurs come along. Actually, it's interesting because in Hong Kong there's a lot of startups. And actually, it's a good mixture of male and female. Very good mixture, I have to tell you. Very good mixture. But it's very interesting when you ask them, being in Hong Kong, they still around that, like, I'm going to make money, I'm going to get rich, I think. So it's interesting what you're saying. You're saying there's a, there's a different approach to it. I know money is important, but you're saying the driver is not like, I'm going to do an IPO. Right? The driver is, I'm going to build something of value. And you're saying, in your experience, that's happening more from the female part of our world than the male part. Is that correct? Well, you know, actually, I've also been meeting with male entrepreneurs and millennials. And I get a sense that they're also drawn for the social uh, enterprise. So I cannot say that women, it's, this is exclusive to women. But what I can You should do. You know, the press love that. <laughs> yes, it's Talk to the media. It's millennials. millennials. It's just millennials. Yeah, yeah. Men don't know anything about it. No, I mean, 
not so so there's definitely it's interesting to just observe the millennial generation in general in terms of startups but yeah but you know it's funny because of people who hire millennials they're known as a headache millennial equals won't stay in the job for long right in hong kong when people hire millennials they're like oh my god then, excuse me how long have you been in Kong? so <laughs> You know, the, the theory, I, I didn't hire you, but the, there is a concept of the millennial that, you know, they're, they're very empowered, which is great, but they're a bit indecisive, and they're not willing to stick it, stick at it, right? There's another side to it. So I understand what you're saying, and I'm wondering, I'm involved with a lot of startups, I mentor a lot of these people, and a lot of them are like, I got tired of my corporate job and I want to do something for myself. So the question I have is, do millennials have sticking power? Because if you start a business, you need to stick at it so much harder than anything else that's ever been put in front of you. So, ask, does do millennials have sticking power? Winnie? I, I, think, <laughs> I think that I've got for four plus years. Four plus years, yeah, she's, she's an unusual case. But. How often do you get called by a headhunter? Every week. Exactly. I think Jennifer is like a great example of those. I mean, she is really going for it. She's this yeah, Jennifer was a. Yeah, beautiful and Senior also very... Senior entrepreneur who is proof of what I'm sharing. I mean, I had the pleasure of speaking with her a little bit earlier and everything I'm saying is true to me. Okay, so let's go back to survey. So you've got this community, you're going to empower them, okay? So I want to know, so in these countries you've been to, have you found that the barriers that women encounter are different? Absolutely. Unfortunately, what I am seeing is that there are sexism, problems everywhere and doesn't matter what the culture sorry what the countries you went to australia korea australia new zealand, new zealand indonesia korea korea Japan, singapore, Japan. singapore Thailand. there are definitely so, so what's interesting is there's sexism there's ageism there's racism there's all sorts of isms and i choose not to focus on those because i don't it's like Millennial where do you put ism. your it's where you where do you put your energy right you want to put it in building and creating connecting and collaborating versus all these isms but to answer your question there are there are barriers that women have to overcome i mean one thing for example i spoke with a japanese woman in, in singapore and uh, she's an entrepreneur and she said I actually moved from Japan to Singapore so that I could actually start off my business because after I got married and I had a child it was virtually socially and financially impossible for me to, to, to start my business there so there's all that's quite interesting so you're saying people will actually move or women in this case women, will move women are moving move for a life. career yes, how many are. women in this room moved here for a career how many men in this room moved here for a career? <laughs> that balanced. But, but it's interesting, you're saying that people will move, or women in this case, because their culture doesn't allow it. And I lived in Japan for two years, I know exactly what you're talking about. Basically, once you're married, you're you know, locked up at home. Right? So you're saying she moved to Singapore because she wanted the opportunity to work. Yes, and this is what's happening. It's so great, and I think everyone should know about this, that women are, I mean, you ask about the, the stickiness, the millennial stickiness. Yeah. I can tell you that these female millennial entrepreneurs that I am meeting, they are saying, I want to do something, and I'm going to go where I can go and explore these dreams, these visions I'm having. So that's interesting. They're willing to take the extra risk of moving to a totally different country and a totally different culture with a child, in this case. To start a business. That's pretty great. Yeah, so there are there there is a range between being single, married and with a child. But yes, more and more On your blog I saw like there was like divorced and starting businesses or something. Was it Australia? Or New Zealand or somewhere like that? There was Actually, yeah, there was like a bunch of women you met who like like fuck that. Get rid of those blokes. We're gonna start fresh. Yes, yeah, so there is there is a woman uh, yeah, there are there are women who get divorced and this is so, so I think what you read about was during during this tour. What we've also been doing is having meetups with women in the local area where we we're staying. So this is outside of the interviews, and we've just having we're, we're just having organic chats, informal chats of the journey of what it means to be a female millennial entrepreneur. And some of these things have come up in that particular conversation. It was about. Uh, we focus a lot about what sort of initiated the start of 
them becoming entrepreneurs. And sometimes it, it does happen to be a death or a divorce or childbirth or something, something cataclysmic. So that's been interesting. I always admire women who start a business after giving birth because it's like you've got two things to look after, right? That's Usually three because the husband becomes a child as well. <laughs> so, so this is really interesting. So you go around these countries and um, are, are these women getting into technology? Is this because they've read Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In book? What, what is driving them? Is this, you think this is a new phenomenon? Is this a form of feminism, but in a slightly gentler way? Or is it, what is it? Is this... Should I say feminism? You can say whatever. <laughs> There's no done. Yeah, I'm just curious. Well, what's driving it? I think, like I said, it's a generational thing. So you have an entire generation of women who were brought up by baby boomers at Generation X who had the safety net of a job and everything else, and then the economy collapses, and, and millennials have to face the reality of no jobs or jobs that they don't like. And they've been brought up uh, with, most of the time, from my observations, parents who have said, you're the best, you're special, you can do it. And so these millennials are actually quite confident in themselves, and they're like, yeah, I can do it. If I'm going to do what I like, and I'm going to go figure it out. So it's sort of this generational concept of going out and doing it. And instead of working up to a title, they're just creating a title and living in it. And they're really excited about it, and they won't take no for an answer. If you tell them no, they'll go start it themselves. You know? And do you think this is because there's a general culture of startup around the world? The word startup, is, the word startup has become very sexy, or the two words startup, has become very sexy, right? You know, I'm a work for startup. I have a startup. I do. So, do you think it's that whole branding around startups that's, that's allowing people to go out and do that? Because in Hong Kong, we have the same culture, but it's more of, you know, stay working for your big company because if you go and do it by yourself, it's too risky, and you never know it might go bust tomorrow. So, are you seeing this as a? It's the, it's the fact that people can go out. The fear of failure is, is less. No, the fear of failure is definitely there. Still there. In fact, there's fear of success as well, and all sorts of other fears. But I think That's interesting. What's the fear of success? I've never heard that. Is that an American thing? No, actually, on this on this tour, a lot I've interviewed 20 women. This has come up quite often, actually. The fear of succeeding. In I think this is where you define the difference between a man and a woman in terms of entrepreneurship. The men are scared shitless of failing. That they lose their faces. What you're saying, you're seeing a bit of fear of success. Yeah, so, so what if you become the next Oprah? What happens? I don't know, right? No, Even if you become famous like Kim Kardashian and, yeah, and you have no freedom, well, you do, but your body becomes different. You know, what, the follow up conversation that I've had is really around what does this mean? Feel so why, why, why would anybody be scared to be, you know, Oprah? Oprah, sorry. Oh, Why? What's wrong with being her? Well, there's a lot of pressure that comes with it. You know, actually, I interviewed one of the women that is considered most powerful women in Asia, back in Thailand. Oh, and what's her name? One of can you pronounce her Thai name Rung, if you can? Rung Chat. Oh, God. Rung. And she's a, she runs her own... What does she do? Yeah, uh, Meli? Mali. 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 I don't know. What is it? It's actually the biggest fruit company, okay. fruit juice company. Though. And she told you. Anyway, so we were talking about this, and she said, you know, she said, uh, I asked her, I said, you were just named one of Asia's most powerful women. Uh, what does that mean? How does that change your life? And she said, it just puts a lot of pressure on me. I don't know that I am the only, I should have been the woman that received this title, it could have been anybody else, and now the pressure is on me. And, you know, didn't, that, that was sort of, it sort of shows you a little bit of the female perspective in terms of the other conversations that I've had that are pretty similar in terms of, if I'm successful, if I'm viewed as successful, then I have all eyes on me, the spotlight is on me, and I have to continue to deliver, and now I'm afraid of, failing and looking like dog in front of everyone. Wow. Who's a successful woman? Jennifer, are you scared of success? Um, I'll tell you this, people are threatened by successful women 
And um, I sometimes uh, want the choice between like, do I do well or often on the side and maximize more people. And uh, the other thing is, you mentioned that in a beautiful way, right? I spent my whole life trying to prove that there's some things in my degree. I quit acting and modeling because I was actually starting to get famous in New York, and then I was frightened of that. And then um, even with my businesses, I played into the man who started game. And I think a lot of, uh, there's still a lot of rampant sexism and um, a lot of uh, things that need to change in the DC startup world and culture. And then in answer to like entrepreneurialism and millennials, I think if you create a proper culture for them, it gets sticky. You don't have to be a founder to be an entrepreneur. You can encapsulate the spirit of entrepreneurialism by joining like-minded tribes of people who are spouses the same values. There you go. You've got to get her on your. You've got to get her on YouTube. <laughs> Jennifer on YouTube. Interesting. So, who are you interviewing in Hong Kong? Uh, well, I am. I believe Anita is here. Anita, are you still here? Yeah. Woo. I'm, I'm interviewing her. And what's she doing? She has. Well, maybe she can tell us about. Anita, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, come on. Here. Hi, everyone. Um, this is before you go on YouTube. The edit, the free cuts, behind the scenes. Um, so I'm working on a platform called Damn Local, and it connects a traveler to a local who will take you around on a custom tour. So ultimately, it'll be a sharing economy platform. And I'm very excited to do So I want to know what what is there a particular line of business that these women are going into? Are you finding that it's everything? Or are, there, are you seeing a certain area that they tend to lean towards? Is it more like, you know, uh, cosmetics? Or, no, I'm saying that Jennifer does that. Um, I'm not saying, no, she does, she does it. I'm not stereotyping, that's what she does. She's got a product, that's cool. If she could come up and talk about yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, come on. Let's see a millennial entrepreneur in action. Okay, so. Got 30 seconds, starting now. Compact is the first all-in-one makeup compact with a, a LED light, with an LED light, and it's completely interchangeable, modular, so you can customize for the first time. Girls can customize their own compact. There's less than a one in 100 million chance they're going to have the same one. Each glam pack is as different as the girls who carry it. It's uniting beauty and technology, and we're doing a mobile place soon. That's uh, basically going to make this the, the iPhone all your makeup. It's giving women their time and their space back. And uh, we launched, uh, we partnered with Uber last week for our launch of this product. It's rapidly selling out. We have a presence now in 60 countries. We're a little over a year old. And it's for the entrepreneurs. And I'm waiting for Lolita to come customize her. But Lolita doesn't need any makeup. She, she looks gorgeous, gorgeous without it. It's gorgeous. Right. And Thanks. it's about um, the girls knowing that they're already beautiful without it. It's just like helping you touch up throughout your business. Nice. All right. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So. This is exactly the most fulfilling part of doing the Ash Show, that there are amazing women like Jennifer all over the world, and people need to know about them. So why has Cheryl Sandberg not got her own show? Are you going to sell it to Cheryl Sandberg? Why do you call it the Ash Show, in. otherwise known as Lean In? <laughs> okay, so Lean In, it's, this is a very good question, and I've actually had the sort of you yeah. interview Cheryl Sandberg? That, that I, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I really have, this is a real woman type of show. This isn't your, I want to go and meet Oprah, and I do, and actually I do want to meet her, so if anyone has connections, please introduce me, I am happy to do it. No, but for the F show, it's really uh, bringing real stories, real women, and... What's a not real woman? Is a hermaphrodite? I don't normal, know. okay, this is a very, yeah, this is slippery slope. I can okay, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. Slippery slope. Don't go there. I want to hear about, so back to the, the subject. What subject? Cheryl Sandberg getting the Cheryl show. Sandberg. So Cheryl Sandberg, she really focuses on the corporate route. So again, you know, going back to my story when I was telling you, so I So she's not an entrepreneur. Trouble. She's not officially she, an entrepreneur. She is very supportive of all women. Uh, there's definitely a focus on the intrapreneur yep. in the corporate space, and I really believe in what she's talking about. I believe in Arena Huffington, all these messages, they're beautiful messages. The thing is that, again, it's accessible to so many people, 
and entrepreneurship is accessible to all. And I see, as I opposed to a, an executive who's only accessible to a small and right. to be a serious executive in a big firm, whether it's male or female, it's damn hard. It's damn hard, yeah. And and I, I want to work towards something that helps more women than less. Did you have a question? Huh? No, not yet, not yet. No? So, okay, so, so, what's going to happen with the show? What are you going to do? When is it going to come out? When are we going to see some videos, apart from you, saying, this is what I'm here for? <laughs> yeah, hopefully everyone's watched my videos. We live in a real-time world, right? You can't wait six months to make a video. This is, this is well, Hong Kong. You deal. can't, we need videos here's, tomorrow. Here's the deal. There's, I'm, I'm a quality over quantity. Winnie, are you leaving? <laughs> She said she had to do it. Winnie is desperate to be uh, an entrepreneur. She's brilliant. She's very talented. Thank you. And also very beautiful. But she needs to talk to you more because she has a lot of brains and she can't get out of the corporate world. I've had you six times. Yeah, thanks. So. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So, so, yeah, so tell me, how do you. How do you what, I'm not going to ask you now. Just keep listening. Yeah, so I want to know, I want to know in, in the, the show, how does that. Why does it take so long to get content onto it? We live in a real-time world with social media, right? Yes. It's all about where's the next photo, where's the next video, where's the next soundbite. Yeah, so I'm really focusing on creating a quality product. Yeah. And so I, it's only me in this project, so that's part of the reason that it's going to take some time. And I plan for it to come out mid-next year. Uh, I ideally will have somebody that will help me with the editing. I, right now I have... Probably around a hundred hours worth of interviews. And there's no fellow fem foodpreneurs who say, Hey, I'm here, I'll help you. Not yet, actually. We haven't found no? editing people yet so far. Okay. Anybody in this room can edit? What? Edit. Edit video. There you go, there's a player that's willing to help you. Right here, yay! <laughs> What's your name? Julian. 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 Later. I will, I will be contacting <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, that's part of it. But also, I mean, we're traveling the world, we're doing 16 countries in about six months, so how much can you handle to do at that time, right? Just moving from place to place, and some of these places are like Myanmar. Um, yeah. You don't know if you're gonna have But why haven't you been very millennial and put it on like Vine or Snapchat? Why are you putting it on YouTube? Isn't because that a bit, kind of, an, like, is that a bit passe? I'm an older millennial. <laughs> I don't know about So what's, what's younger than you? What, what's after millennials? Zillennials. Zillennials? Yeah. Who came up with that one? I don't know. Like, so they're on Vine. Z. They're on Vine. They're cruising. They're, Actually, they're making like... And it really is Gen Z, with Z, which is really interesting. Gen V. There should be a Vine. I think you can make some really good <laughs> summaries for men to watch, because our attention span is short. And then we can go like, yeah, 30 seconds, got it. Actually, the videos will be about six minutes. Long. It's too long for a man. At least, yeah. uh, it's not your audience, not me. Oh. So, are you going to turn this into a business? Is this going to be profitable? Yes. How? Yeah. So the idea. YouTube is... advertising. You're not going to get enough views. So I am a salesperson by heart, and I believe there are three things that are super important for a salesperson. That is to know their customer, to know their customer's goals and their issues, and thirdly is to figure out how you can help them with their goals and, and their um, problems, right? And so this is also partially doing my research for that. So I'm setting up to really understand this this market, the, the female millennial, future entrepreneur, and the millennial entrepreneurs, the, the ladies who are doing it already. And what I want to do is to have a collective of women who have different courses, different services and products that help these future entrepreneurs become entrepreneurs and feel like they have the foundation of videos and uh, MP3s and books and one-on-one -on -one services that will help them through their... So you become like an accelerator for female entrepreneurs, is that right? Mm -hmm. You're saying I'm going to have all the advice yeah. you need, no? No, no, because I do want this to be more of an online course kind of setup. Okay. And and the reason I love to partner with people. I believe that it takes an entire community. This is a global community project for the global community. So in your on your travels, apart from interviews, have you found people who want to partner with you? Yes. Like this dinner for ten lady who's gone. 
So the idea that they partner with you, has that happened? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so there are a couple of organizations who have approached me and we're discussing but this is sort of the longer, the longer vision in terms of what the FSHA we have. This is absolutely an investment, getting to really know what's needed out there, filling the gaps, and, and bringing so the right people together. It's a marketplace for people entrepreneurs. And yeah, and so it's not about me, it's about the collective and the tribe. Yeah, but it's all got your name on it. Yes. The leads of style got me everywhere, So right? doesn't everything need a leader? It does. So I'm one of... Okay within the tribe that I serve and I work for. Excellent. All right. Any questions? Any questions? Julia? The video man? Oh. And you're always good for a question. No, not really. Yes, Julia. You're scared. Define for yourself what's entrepreneurship for you? Sure. Uh, so, an entrepreneur for me is someone who's gone out to decide to either address a problem or some sort of goal, personal or otherwise, and they're committed to creating a profit. I mean, I think an entrepreneur is for profit. Uh, there are non profit, I guess organizations as well, but I, I see an entrepreneur as a for-profit machine. Do you agree with that? You said a for-profit machine? Yeah, I think it is about making money. At the end of the day, an entrepreneur, I think, seeks to make money. It's not, uh, with that caveat that I just said, because there's social entrepreneurship that then, it's about a lot about the diction. Like some people think that social entrepreneurship means non-profit for some it means for profit so it really i mean it's addiction type of thing but for me uh it's it's a for-profit sort of project okay would you a female movie director is she an entrepreneur or not is she making money <laughs> well i mean like she's probably having all kind of reasons why she's making the movie but thinks about making money if there's a business plan yes if there's a plan to make I think it's a bit unfair because she's not here to define the word entrepreneur. Yeah, right? no, no, I just try I to mean, understand. You've got to be careful because the word entrepreneur, like a startup, has started to mean a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. You know, the original word was you have something to sell, I take it from you and I sell it to her. I'm in the middle. I'm the right. middle man. Right, so it's a, I don't get stuck on entrepreneur. I don't think it's worth it. I'd like to know actually what he. What What's your definition is? of entrepreneur? I mean, I'm happy to. I want to know your definition. Oh, that's right, back in this place. I learned this from my mother. <laughs> my mother. If somebody asks you a difficult question, throw it back in their face. That's good. 
<laughs> no, I, I don't want to be somebody who has all the answers, of course. I'm, I, think, I think it's an interesting question, and I agree that what you say, and that it's... You're saying it's... It, you, you just, your finished definition as a, a, let's say, basically profit-making machine, which I think there's social entrepreneurship, and I think innovation has a lot to do with entrepreneurship. Basically, you said solving a problem, trying to find a solution to a problem, but finding a solution to a problem is not always 